This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to continue to learn to play Star Wars Armada. Star Wars Armada was released in 2015 by Fantasy Flight Games and designed by James Niffen and Christian T. Peterson. The game takes about two hours to play. Let's briefly discuss the game components we've covered thus far. Star Wars Armada's main game components can be divided into three groups. Ships, Squadrons, and Upgrades. These components are placed in the following areas. The Game Map, or the Player Area. In our last episode we learned about ships, how they're represented on the game map with figures, and in the player area with ship cards. Ships provide players with the necessary firepower to dismantle enemy fleets. We also learned about the upgrades that are available for ships. With upgrades, players can enlist famous leaders and personnel specialists as well as install powerful weapons and defense systems on their ships. In this episode we're going to learn about squadrons. Players can deploy squadrons to lash out at enemy warships and defend their own vessel's vulnerabilities against enemy fighters. We will then take this information about the game's components and learn how to build fleets. Players each build their fleets and purchase these components with their fleet points. Once we've learned how to use all these components and how to build fleets with them, we will finish the tutorial with setting up the game. Now let's take a closer look at how squadrons function in the game. In Star Wars Armada's game phases, squadron is the third phase of the sequence. During this phase, players take alternating turns activating two of their squadrons. When a squadron is activated, they have a choice. They can execute a squadron maneuver or they can conduct a squadron attack. Squadrons can be activated early in the ship phase if the player has selected a squadron as their command on the command dial, or the player has banked a squadron token. Now let's learn more about the squadron components and their abilities. Squadrons are represented on the game map with these squadron figures. Players can keep track of important squadron statistics with these cards in their play area. First, let's look at the information presented on the base of the squadron figures. The arrow on the squadron base tracks the number of hull points that the squadron currently has. The squadron's hull rating can be confirmed here on the squadron card. If the squadron possesses any special abilities, they're marked by icons at the top of the base. Definitions for these special abilities can be found here on the squadron card. The Activation tab keeps track of whether that squadron has been activated during the current round. When the game begins, all activation tabs are set to blue. The color corresponds to the current side of the initiative token. Once the squadron has been activated, you push in the tab. While in the blue phase, this makes it easy to check the gameplay area to see which squadrons remain to be activated. When the round changes, all the squadrons are now set to red and ready to be activated for the next round, at which point the process reverses. Now let's take a closer look at the squadron card. Starting from the left, let's review the icons in the middle of the card. The first statistic tells you the squadron's speed. This TIE Fighter squadron has a speed of 4. Speed is measured from the squadron's base with the range ruler. Measure out 4 on the range ruler and move the squadron to that position. The next statistic is the squadron's hull rating. A squadron's hull rating is the number of damage cards that they can sustain before being destroyed. The next statistic is this squadron's attack rating against other squadrons. And finally is the attack rating versus ships. The bottom of the card lists the squadron type and the fleet point cost. 
In Star Wars Armada, you can also field elite squadrons led by famous aces. A model's base can be outfitted with a dial that has the aces icon. These aces add additional special abilities as well as defense tokens. These squadron defense tokens function the same as they do with larger ships and allow squadrons to mitigate enemy attacks. Be aware that the fleet point cost for a squadron with an ace is much higher than a standard squadron. Next, let's discuss how squadron movement and combat works. As we saw previously, squadrons move using the range ruler. The range ruler is also used to measure the squadron's attack radius. Squadrons can only attack at a range of one, whether it be against ships or other squadrons. Unlike ships that can move and attack, squadrons must make a choice. They can either move or attack. Since we've already seen an example of movement, let's look at the attack function. Squadrons can attack in a 360 degree radius. Any ships or squadrons within this range are subject to attack. Each dice roll that scores a hit reduces one point from the hull. However, any criticals that are rolled are counted as a miss unless that squadron has the bomber ability. For example, the X-Wing Squadron has the Bomber ability. Now, let's look at one of the game's more complex subjects, Squadron Engagement. When one squadron is within attack range of another squadron, they're considered engaged. Engagement does not occur when a squadron is moving through another squadron's attack range. Only squadrons in a starting or ending position can be engaged. Under these conditions, multiple squadron engagements can occur in the gameplay area. Essentially, the squadrons are engaged in a dogfight with each other. When squadrons are engaged, they must follow these rules. Squadrons that are engaged cannot move, and they can only attack the squadrons they're engaged with. Engagement can be broken under the following conditions. A squadron's line of sight is obstructed, for example, a larger ship plows between the two squadrons. Or, the last engaged squadron is destroyed. Now that we understand squadrons a little better, let's talk about one of the key strategies. If left undefended, our Star Destroyer could be attacked by multiple X-Wing squadrons. However, if we're prudent, we can defend the Star Destroyer with TIE squadrons. The attacking X-Wing squadrons will be forced to dogfight with the TIE fighters and unable to attack the ship. Keep these strategies and counters in mind as you learn to play Star Wars Armada. Now let's talk about the special abilities of squadrons. There are currently five squadron abilities in Star Wars Armada. Swarm, Bomber, Counter, Escort, and Heavy. Let's begin by talking about Swarm. With the Swarm ability, a squadron can reroll one attack dice. The Bomber ability enables a squadron to conduct critical attacks. With the Counter ability, a squadron can perform a counter attack when attacked by another squadron. If both squadrons have counter, then the ability is cancelled out. The Escort ability only applies if you have the appropriate expansion. Squadrons with the Escort ability prevent squadrons they are engaged with from performing attacks against squadrons without the Escort ability. Essentially, this allows squadrons to shield other squadrons from enemy attack. The Heavy ability is also a rule that only applies to expansions. A squadron classified as heavy does not prevent engaged squadrons from attacking ships or moving. These last two squadron abilities often play against each other in the example of TIE Bombers, B-Wings, and Y-Wings. Squadrons with the heavy rating may need escorts to conduct bombing runs. It is not necessary to focus on these rules if you only own the core set. 
Now that we've learned all the components in Star Wars Armada, let's learn about fleet building. Players build their fleets with three types of components. Ship cards, squadron cards, and upgrade cards. The lower right hand corner of the card lists the unit's fleet cost. These three components provide a great deal of customization, but there are some limitations to be aware of. Some key component limitations to be aware of when building your fleet are for the following. Squadron aces, commanders, and titles. Any name preceded by a dot can only be used once per build. Fleet points with a rebel symbol or imperial symbol preceding them can only be used by that specific faction. If you're familiar with Star Wars lore, most of the time this is obvious. Now a quick reminder on commander upgrades and title upgrades. Only one commander upgrade can be purchased per fleet. Also, the ship that the commander is assigned to becomes the fleet's flagship. Title upgrades can only be assigned to a specific type of ship. There are three title upgrades in the core set, one for each type of ship. Now that we know the available components and the limitations, let's look at building fleets. Before a match begins, each player will mutually agree on the number of fleet points for each side. Now the core rulebook recommends a 300 point fleet build. The rules were written with the thought that you would no doubt be adding expansions to your fleet. The two builds I'm about to show you with 300 points are almost kitchen sink builds. I crammed everything I could think of into it and I still could not get anywhere near 300 points. So let's look at the 300 point build and then we'll look at a more reasonable build size for the core set. When building their fleet, players can experiment with the mix of squadrons, ships, and upgrades. No matter how many fleet points you're allocated with, a key rule is that you can only use a third of those for your squadrons. In this example, it would be the first 100 points. For the Imperial Navy squadrons, I used all six TIE Fighter models with five being standard and one being elite. I chose the Victory 2 variant class Star Destroyer. And I fully loaded the ship with all upgrades. The Imperial Navy's build totaled 227 fleet points. For the Rebel Alliance fleet, I selected all four X Wing models three standard and one elite. I selected the more expensive Nebulon B and CR-90 Corvette variants and fully loaded both ships with upgrades. The Rebel Alliance's total fleet cost was 232 points. Another concept to consider is the player with the least amount of fleet points spent gets to choose who has the initiative at the beginning of the match. In this example, the Imperial Navy would get to make the decision of who goes first in the match. Keep this in mind as another rule when you're building fleets. Now, in the latest Star Wars Armada tournament rules, the fleet point amount for core set tournaments is set at 180 points. I would recommend the 180 point tournament build after you've become familiar with the 300 point builds. With the 300 point builds, you can try out everything. Once you've developed a taste for a particular playstyle, then the 180 point build is going to force you to make tough choices when building your fleets. Now let's look at some 180 point fleet builds that I've put together. With a 180 point fleet build, the squadron limit is now set at 60 points. Let's look at an Imperial Navy build. I kept the TIE Fighter squadrons maxed out with 5 standard and 1 elite. I downgraded my Star Destroyer to a Victory Class 1. And I chopped down my upgrades considerably. 
This brought the build for the Imperial Navy to 178 points. For the Rebel Fleet I also left the squadrons maxed out with 3 Standard and 1 Elite. I downgraded both the Nebulon B and the CR-90 Corvette to their cheaper versions. With this build I had 30 points left to squeeze in some upgrades. This left the Rebel Alliance build at 179 points. Now these two scratch builds are probably going to stir some disagreement. Obviously they would do it differently and that's the whole point. By using the 180 point core set tournament build you're going to see more focused playstyles and want to try out different combinations. You'll no doubt learn a lot more with these restrictions than you would with the kitchen sink builds. One remaining aspect of fleet building is the integration of objective cards. Before a match begins, each player must have three objective cards assigned to his fleet build. There are three types of objective cards. Assault based objective cards. Assault objective cards typically identify one or more ships that are worth extra fleet points when damaged or destroyed. Defense based objective cards. Defense objective cards alter the play area to provide a significant advantage to one player. And navigation based objective cards. Navigation objective cards reward players who maneuver aggressively and precisely in the gameplay area. Each of these objective cards may require special setup rules, gameplay rules, and in-game situations. During the fleet building process, each side will choose three objective cards. The objective card that will ultimately be used for the match will be decided during the setup phase, which is our next section. Star Wars Armada is definitely a miniatures game, and that means you'll need a fairly good size open space to play the game. So first, let's learn how to set up the gameplay area. In step 1, you're going to define the play area. For the first few practice games, find a clear area that is 3 feet by 3 feet. At each corner of the 3 by 3 area, place one of the setup area markers. These setup area markers will establish the boundaries for the play area. Once you and your friends become comfortable with the game, you can lay out larger play spaces. The play area dimensions really depend on the size and type of your fleets. Fantasy Flight's organized play tournaments use a 6 foot by 3 foot play area. Imagine two of these 3 by 3 areas stacked on top of each other. Next, we're going to set the boundaries for each side's deployment area. To establish these boundaries, we're going to use the range ruler. I've enlarged the range ruler here so it's easier to see the numbers. The length of each deployment area is a range of 3 on the range ruler. Now, let's draw out each deployment zone. First, let's mark out our rebel deployment zone. And next, our imperial deployment zone. In step 2, you're going to gather the game components. We're not going to place the ships on the gameplay area just yet, but you need to make sure they're ready to place. To ready the squadrons, make sure all the activation tabs are set to blue. To prepare your ships, make sure the shield dials on the ship's base are set to the maximum allowed shield rating. Each player is going to place all his game components in his personal play area and get them ready to play. Now let's take a look at the personal gameplay area and see what that looks like. This is the recommended setup for the individual play area. On the left side are a player's squadron components. Multiple squadrons in the gameplay area are referenced off a single squadron card. Elite squadrons led by aces have their own unique card with defense tokens. On the right side are the player's ship components. 
The ship in the gameplay area is represented by the ship card. That ship's command dials and defense tokens are placed next to the card. In step 3, you're going to determine initiative. The player who spent the least amount of fleet points to build their fleet is the one that gets to decide who begins with the initiative. For example, when we built fleets earlier, the Imperial side used less fleet points, so they would get to decide who goes first. Once the initiative player has been decided, it's time to choose objectives. Now let's pause for a moment and learn about the objective card selection process. Earlier, we talked about integrating objective cards into your fleet builds. So at this point, each player should have selected three objective cards. The player with the least amount of fleet points gets to choose who has the initiative. In our example, we determined that was the Imperial player. So at this point, the Imperial player has a choice. If the Imperial player selects themselves for the initiative, essentially the player who goes first, then they look at the second player's objective cards and select one that will become the objective card for the match. All other objective cards are discarded. Now let's reset the cards and look at this again. If the Rebel Alliance player is selected, then the Rebel Alliance player will look at the Imperial player's objective cards and select one that will become the objective for the match. So as you can see, there's a lot of strategy involved with building the fleets and selecting the objective cards. The player with the least amount of fleet points gets to choose who gets to go first. And the player that's selected to go first must choose from the other player's objective cards. So each player should plan out their three objective cards very carefully. Now that the objective card has been selected, it's possible that there's a special setup rule for the gameplay area. So for step 5, you're going to place obstacles. Starting with the second player, each player will take turns placing obstacles in the gameplay area. Now let's bring up the range rule to look at the rules of placement. When an obstacle is placed, it must be a range of 3 from the edge of the gameplay area. And an obstacle has to be at least a range of 1 from another obstacle. So starting with player 2, each side will place an obstacle. Typically this is about 6 obstacles in the gameplay area. Player 2 places the first obstacle. Player 1 places the second obstacle. The distance is measured. Player 2 brings in the third obstacle. Player 1 brings in the fourth obstacle. Player 2 brings in the fifth obstacle. And Player 1 brings in the sixth obstacle. And that's just a basic example of how to set obstacles. Individual objective cards may have other requirements. In step 6, players will deploy their ships. Starting with the first player, each player will deploy a set number of ships and squadrons into their own deployment area. Now, let's talk about the rules of deployment. When taking their turn in deployment, a player has a choice. They can deploy a single ship or two squadrons. When a player places his ship, he must also set the speed dial at which it will start at. Squadrons must be placed within a distance of 1 to 2 of a friendly ship. If a player has one squadron remaining when he must place two, he cannot place it until he's placed all of his ships. So let's say the Imperial Navy has the initiative. They're the first player. The Imperial player decides to deploy their one ship. This ship's speed dial is set to 2. The Rebel player decides to deploy one ship, the Corvette. This ship's speed dial is set to 3. The Imperial player deploys two TIE Fighter squadrons. The Rebel player deploys another ship, the Nebulon B. This ship's speed dial is set to 3. The Imperial player deploys two more TIE Fighter squadrons. The Rebel player deploys two X-Wing squadrons. 
the Imperial player deploys their last two TIE Fighter squadrons, and the Rebel player deploys their last two X-Wing squadrons. And with that, ship deployment is complete. In step 7, you're going to prepare other components. This includes the range ruler, the maneuvering tool, the damage deck, the dice, and these command tokens. These components should be placed in an area where both players can reach them. Finally, in step 8, there's cleanup. Cleanup is essentially removing any unnecessary components from the gameplay area. The rulebook says you can remove the setup area markers from the play area, but I usually just leave them there. Now you're set up and ready to start playing. A game of Star Wars Armada takes six rounds to play, so let's cover off one last time on the phases of play in a single round. Now that we've learned how the components work and set up the game, let's review the game phases. A game round is divided into four phases. First is the command phase, followed by the ship phase, then the squadron phase, and finally the status phase. Now, let's look at the steps for each phase. In the command phase, each player will conduct their actions secretly and simultaneously. First, they select one of four options for their next command. They set those commands on a command dial, and then place that dial on the bottom of their command dial stack. During the ship phase, each player will take alternating turns activating one ship. First, they will reveal the command dial from the top of their command dial stack. They then must choose whether they will spin that dial immediately or bank it as a command token. Next, they will conduct two attacks from separate hulls on their ship. And finally, they will execute their ship maneuver. When all ships on both sides have been activated, proceed to the next phase. In the squadron phase, each player will take alternating turns to activate two of their squadrons. When activating a squadron, a choice is required. That squadron can execute a squadron maneuver, or they can conduct a squadron attack. Attacks can be made against ships or other squadrons if they're within range 1 on the range ruler. When all squadrons on both sides have been activated, proceed to the next phase. Finally, in the status phase, each player will clean up and prepare for the next round. First, refresh all defense tokens. The player who has initiative flips the token over and passes it to the other player. And finally, the round marker will be advanced to the next number. When the round marker reaches 6, the game is over. Fleet points are added up from defeated ships and squadrons. The player with the most fleet points wins the game. And that concludes our gameplay tutorial for Star Wars Armada, the core set. Questions about this game, requests for future Harsh Rules game tutorials, and constructive feedback are all greatly appreciated. Drop a line in the comments section. To be the first notified when this episode and any Harsh Rules episode is placed online, please subscribe to this channel. Until then, I'm Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode.